today. Um, we're kicking off a, a three-part lecture series today from Rohit Papu, who obviously is one of the pioneers of the whole field of condensates. And, and Rohit's lectures are the latest installments in our series of what we're calling kitchen table talks, in which we invite prominent researchers in the condensate field to share their thinking about their recent work with the entire global community. And all of those lectures can be found on condensates.com and we're adding more all the time. Rohit's uh, three lectures in his series, um, in that series he'll be presenting on the molecular grammar of biomolecular condensates. And today in part one, he'll cover the basic physics of associative polymers, the stickers and spacers model, and also the insights that are emerging from the application of this model to describe the phase behavior of linear multivalent proteins. And lectures two and three in the series will be next Wednesday, August 5th, and then the following Wednesday, August 12th, and they'll be at the same time as this lecture, 10 o'clock Eastern time. Lecture, lecture two will cover phase transitions of IDRs, intrinsically disordered proteins and domains, while lecture three will cover phase transitions in multi-component systems, which is a fascinating topic in itself. So just a little bit more background on Rohit. He's the Edwin H. Murty Professor of Engineering and the Director of the Center for Science and Engineering of Living Systems at Washington University in St. Louis. And Rohit has made seminal contributions to the field of biomolecular condensates, uh, in particular, the drivers of phase transitions that lead to the formation of protein and RNA condensates and the role that disordered regions play in these complex cellular processes. And Rohit is also a member of DuPont's Scientific Advisory Board, and he's a wonderful advisor to us at DuPont and a, and a great collaborator and a friend. So Rohit, we really want to thank you in advance for what all of us know will be a, a wonderful series of lectures. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you to Jill and uh, Rebecca for, for suggesting this idea and um, for, for doing all the legwork to make what would I, will I think be a seamless operation. Um, I have uh, learned a lot from my conversations with colleagues at DuPont and particularly from Mark. And uh, it, it's, I think it's a wonderful thing to put together um, this kitchen table talk series uh, that is also not for profit, which is really, I think, appreciated by the community. So as Mark pointed out today, what I'm gonna do is sort of focus on this general topic of what I refer to as molecular grammar. Uh, and, and really what this refers to is being able to read information that is written into protein and RNA sequences and connect this information to the driving forces for condensate formation, regulation, dissolution, and so on. So uh, in today's talk, I'll focus primarily on what I'll refer to as linear multivalent proteins. And um, in the interest of sort of telling you exactly what they are right from the get-go, this will be uh, a, a combination of folded domains and disordered regions. So we don't, we make sure that we don't uh, start off with the uh, notion that it's uh, just about intrinsically disordered proteins or regions. So for all of you who are aficionados of condensates, um, this slide is, I think, a um, well-known one since the, this comes from the uh, review paper that uh, Salman Banani, uh, Tony Hyman, and, and Mike Rosen wrote back in 2017, uh, highlighting the fact that there are lots of bodies um, that sometimes go by the name of membraneless organelles or compartments or granules uh, that have been known now for well over 120 plus years, uh, depending on which body we're talking about, to accumulate material, cellular material, uh, primarily in the form of certain types of uh, protein and RNA molecules, either in the cytosol as shown here, yeah, in terms of things like the Balbi antibody, uh, stress granules, uh, processing bodies, or within the nucleus, uh, where in fact, there now is a growing interest and recognition in the possibility that uh, pretty much all of gene regulation might involve um, these membrane-less uh, bodies, which now go by the name of biomolecular condensates. And 
at the get-go, it's worth pointing out that uh, Tony and Mike and Salman were very clear in trying to uh, ascribe this name uh, to imply one thing and one thing alone. A condensate is something that concentrates biomolecules and uh, just like you, and, and the concentration of these molecules is evocative of the idea of condensation. And since it's biomolecules that are being condensed into some body, um, these are referred to as biomolecular condensates. I bring this up because that particular definition is agnostic about the mechanism by which a condensate will form, right? Now, of course, that is being mildly glib because of course, the working hypothesis based on a lot of the extent data, not all of it, but a lot of the data, is that membraneless biomolecular condensates form via some form of phase transitions, and I distinguish spontaneous versus driven uh, to recognize the very real possibility uh, and, and, and uh, also throw a shout out to observations that there are active processes inside the cell which may well control a variety of things including the sizes of condensates, uh, whether or not threshold concentrations pertaining to phase transitions are indeed crossed and so on. So while the precise mechanism may well be condensate specific and context specific, I think where all parties have converged upon is the realization that a hallmark of molecules, macromolecules, be they proteins or nucleic acids, that end up in condensates or seem to be important for driving the formation of condensates have the feature of being multivalent macromolecules. And that's our launching pad for today's discussion. So it turns out that um, while, of course, a lot of the condensate field is very much fixated on the pioneering and shape-shifting ideas of Flory and Huggins and Flory and Stockmeyer dating back to the 1940s. Um, starting in the 1970s with the work of um, Lundberg, followed by the work of Mike Cates and, and, and Steve Witten, uh, or sorry, Tom Witten, um, and then uh, moving on to um, you know, the work of Alexei Semenov and Michael Rubenstein, there's been this recognition that you can make a polymer that essentially is a generic polymer, but you can sprinkle along the polymer uh, some so-called attractive groups. And this, uh, these types of polymers uh, go by the name of associative polymers. And the name that we have co-opted, uh, the sort of the, the term stickers interspersed by spacers is not something that we coined. Uh, we have been extreme, extraordinarily good thieves uh, in sort of you know, co-opting the language that has taken root in the polymer physics literature. And the idea of stickers interspersed by spacers is intended to convey two very important concepts. So stickers shown here in blue are, for lack of a better way of thinking about this, best thought of as being akin to hot spots on protein surfaces where you will get stereospecific or you know, particular types of specific interactions. Um, these will be characterized by a hierarchy of interactions, possibly hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, uh, a range of you know, um, sort of specific hydrophobic types of contributions, et cetera. But the key point is that irrespective of the specific physical chemistry, what we can um, used to delineate a sticker is the fact that there will be physical crosslinks that will form between pairs of stickers. And these stickers, these physical crosslinks will have finite lifetimes based on the strengths of these interactions, the ranges of these interactions, the directionality of the interactions. Now, of course, as depicted in this cartoon, which um, is courtesy of Alex Holhouse, what is depicted here is that the regions that are interspersed between stickers are essentially enabling a huddling or the bringing together of these stickers into spatial proximity 
and therefore the spacers themselves are unlikely to be major players in terms of engaging in physical crosslinks, but they are enabling the physical crosslinking of the stickers. So um, that might sound a little esoteric. Let's try to actually map the stickers and spacers formalism directly onto biological systems. And so here what we've got is an instantiation uh, and I'm starting with folded domains mainly to try to pretty much from the get-go dispense with the idea that condensate formation, proteins that drive condensate formation is somehow the sole purview of intrinsically disordered regions. So in fact, um, sort of concomitant with the development of the associative polymer literature in the physics world was the literature on so-called patchy colloids and in fact, folded domains with interaction hotspots may be thought of as patchy colloids, where essentially what we've got is the valence, i.e. the number of specific binding sites, their interaction ranges and their intrinsic affinities contributing to the overall phase behavior. And for those of you who are interested, it's certainly worth going into the physical literature and looking up the term patchy colloids and sort of learning the fact that, you know, this field is so mature, uh, it's now about 30 years old, that people can sort of design nanomaterials and all kinds of interesting synthetic materials based on sort of a direct tuning of the valence and the interaction strength and the interaction ranges of patches on patchy colloids. So, there is no doubt, and in fact, I, I should throw a shout out here to the work of Daniel Colon Ramos from Yale, who has done some beautiful work with glycolytic enzymes. And in fact, there's not an IDR to be had in that system, but it undergoes this sort of oligomerization transition as a way to generate the requisite multivalence. And in fact, the regulation of, let's say, the delivery of material across synapses seems to be governed by glycolytic enzymes forming condensates. Here are the more sort of notorious or well-known uh, exemplars of um, um, biomolecular condensate formation, particularly phase transitions driven by multivalent molecules. And here what we have are intrinsically disordered regions uh, where the valence, i.e. the number of short linear motifs and the properties of the disordered linkers or spacers contributes directly to the overall phase behavior. And this will be the topic of lecture two. And then we've got the topic for today's discussion, linear multivalent proteins. Um, and simply highlighted here are the types of sort of, you know, polyvalent systems that we'll come across in signaling primarily, um, where you'll have multiple SH3 or SH2 or PDZ or PHD or bromo domains, et cetera, concatenated by disordered linkers. And again here, the valence of the number of domains, but really it's the valence of hotspots or specific binding sites. And what we'll focus on today the properties of the disordered linkers that actually determine the overall phase behavior. Now, I made the point that stickers engage in physical crosslinks. And so you can sort of imagine that if you've got molecules that have sticky Velcro patches, they come together and essentially make a network. And again, if those of you who are interested in sort of more formal parlance, these are supposed to form what are called non-affine networks, which is just a fancy way of saying nonlinear networks. And that nonlinearity here refers to the fact that the combinatorial set of options that I have when I have multivalent systems will give rise to these physically cross-linked networks. So the first message that I would like you to take home right at this slide is that let us not think about these condensates as molecules randomly diffusing around one another like so-called billiard balls, which is what we would refer to as simple liquids, but really these are very much networked liquids or networked molecules. And the key determinant of the overall rheological properties is going to be the time scale of the making and breaking of these physical crosslinks. Now, this is the topic that we're going to discuss. 
And we're motivated here actually by the beautiful and sort of path-breaking work that came from the, the Rosen Lab um, published in Nature uh, in 2012. Um, here is a very sort of simplified version of these, the various systems that they studied. A system of poly SH3 domains. So essentially we've got a multivalent linear, linear multivalent protein where we've got multiple SH3 domains shown in this very high resolution as Pac-Man connected by disordered linkers that can make at the binding site complementary interactions with the proline rich modules designated as PRMs. And again, these are poly SH3 molecules interacting with poly PRMs. So based on what I just told you, you can see that there should be a cross-linking possibility essentially now where you know, a PRM can make an interaction, let's say with one SH3 domain here, but this PRM needn't make an, a, a cross-link with this SH3 domain, but it could make a cross-link with, with an SH3 domain from a different polymer. Right? So now you start to grow the network. So that leads us to the idea then that if I have got these linear multivalent proteins, let's say poly SH3, poly PRMs, I throw them into solution. I start to crank up the concentration, uh, making sure that I maintain, let's say, the one-to-one -one ratio of poly SH3 to poly PRM. What I'll end up with at some concentration, which we'll refer to as the percolation threshold, is the ability to form a network that essentially takes over the entire system. And as a sort of simple way to think about this, this, this is very much along the lines of asking the following question, which is how many Kevin Bacons, let's say, separate a pair of Hollywood actors, right? And the answer is, you know, everybody has a Kevin Bacon number, and that number typically, because he's one of these actors who kind of shows up in every random movie, and so everybody has a Kevin Bacon number of, let's say, between four and seven or something like that. And what that is essentially asking is, if I go from, let's say, one end of my cuvette volume to another end, how many sort of connections do I sort of traverse, right? And the fact that I can go from one end of the system to the other without so-called getting my feet wet essentially means that I now have a system-spanning network. Okay, now let's go to Mike's system. And what he observed was that as he changed the valence of the SH3 domains, i.e. the number of SH3 domains, um, there seemed to be a robust formation of droplets, i.e. system, which he referred to as system spanning networks. Um, and the concentration at which these droplets formed dropped as you increase the valence, okay? Now, what I showed you here is a test tube spanning network. What I'm showing you here are real data, which are showing sort of spherically confined droplets. And so then the obvious question that arises is, how do, what's going on here, right? I mean, where is the system spanning network? So it turns out that what you can do is everything about the networking focuses exclusively on the stickers, the number of stickers, and the affinity of the stickers for one another. But to make a multivalent molecule, of course, I need to concatenate these stickers together. And the way I do that is with the so-called spacers. And these spacers can actually enable what I'll refer to colloquially as a huddling transition it can sort of collect up the, uh, enable, for example, stickers to find one another in a confined volume, right? So that means that the spacers and their particular properties are going to enable a density transition where the percolation is a networking transition, giving rise to two coexisting phases whereby you can have a dense network of molecules coexisting with a dilute solution of largely unnetworked molecules, right? What does this do? What this does is it effectively says the network becomes confined to the spherical droplet, but more importantly, it's enabling this networking transition to happen at concentrations that are well below the um, sort of bulk percolation threshold. So in fact, what the way to think about this is that 
our coexisting sort of dilute phase concentration is at sort of one end. The concentration of macromolecules inside of our dense phase is at, is at the other end. And if the percolation threshold is crossed inside of this confined volume, you end up with essentially what looks like a sort of droplet spanning network, which means that depending on the time scales for the making and breaking of these physical crosslinks, this droplet will behave like an elastic material on some time scales. And in fact, we see this quite often in all of condensatology, where we start to see all kinds of interesting um, differences in the recovery of, let's say, flu flu fluorescence after photo bleaching and so on. So essentially, the way we like to think about this is that this is not simply a phenomenon of liquid-liquid phase separation, but in the lab, at least, we have taken to referring to this as phase separation and percolation. The reason being that in almost all of these um, multivalent systems, these are not pure homopolymers. We probably almost always have this type of an inequality satisfied. For there to be gelation or percolation without phase separation, it must be the case that the spacers really aren't doing their thing and you basically make a test tube spanning network at some ridiculously high concentration. And of course, there is the possibility of precipitation without making networks. And so in that case, the percolation threshold should be larger than the uh, concentration that um, you realize inside of the dense phase. That's a highly unlikely scenario unless one is looking at the formation of amorphous precipitates. So our biased thinking is that all of condensatology, at least that's functionally relevant, really belongs into this AND gate, phase separation and percolation. Okay, so that brings us then to the key point that I've alluded to already, which is that the spacers are really the culprits here, right? So their physical properties are determining whether or not uh, percolation is driven by phase separation, namely I get a spherical droplet inside of which I get a droplet spanning network, or if I essentially go around phase separation and then eventually at some ridiculously high concentration make a gel or a percolated network. So this is the work of Tyler Harmon, which is what I'm going to focus on throughout this talk. He's a former graduate student, currently a postdoc in the lab of, uh, of Frank Ulicher and, and Tony Hyman. Uh, and um, contributions of the intellectual variety from Mike Rosen and, and of the enabling variety from uh, Alex Holhouse, a former graduate student and a postdoc, are not to be sneezed at because they were super important in helping us think. So I, I made the point about physical properties of uh, spacers or linkers. Here's the only math slide that we'll have. And there is a way, it turns out, to sort of summarize the effect of linkers. And that will be in, in the parlance of polymer physicists, excluded volume, but in the interest of making this a bit more uh, accessible to a general audience, we've taken to referring to this as the effective solvation volume. And really what this refers to is if I've got a disordered region connecting a pair of folded domains, there is something that I can quantify, which is the volume per residue that is set aside for interactions with the surrounding volume, uh, solvent rather. And that will be predicated entirely on the nature of the solvent mediated inter residue interactions. And that's what this W of R is actually doing. So let's say I set that to zero. So that's my ideal chain, right? So essentially what that's saying is that the residue solvent and the residue residue interactions are perfectly counterbalanced. What I will basically get back is one minus one, I'll get an effective solvation volume of zero. If these interactions are repulsive, what that is saying is that the residues in the linker really want to be solvated, okay? What I will now get back is essentially an effective solvation volume that is large and positive, reflective of the fact that the inter-residue interactions are on balance repulsive. Conversely, if the linker really doesn't like to make interactions with the solvent, it becomes super sticky for itself. These interactions as modeled by the W of R are going to be pre predominantly 
negative uh, or attractive, and the effective solvation volume referenced to the ideal chain will become negative. It's easier to show that here in a movie where basically I have got between two SH3 domains linkers of different categories. And you can see here that the um, high effective so positive solvation volume linkers are in fact going to be, uh, I'll play that again, uh, are going to be quite expanded. The ones that are agnostic are essentially making rapid fluctuations into and out of expanded and compacted conformations, whereas the very sticky linkers basically are pretty much like falling, uh, forming folded domains. So Alex and Tyler went through the human proteome of IDRs, focused on IDRs that connect folded domains as linkers. And what we were expecting to find was, you know, oh, look, all linkers are sort of exactly the same. And in fact, that's not the case, right? And it turns out that about 68% of linkers have sort of either a close to zero or positive excluded volume or effective solvation volume. But there are, in fact, a whole host of linkers that tend to be high and sort of very sticky for one another. What's interesting, though, is that a lot of the linkers that are in the zero or positive effective solvation volume category are the ones that are prevalent in polyvalent molecules, whereas the ones that are super sticky are sort of in, you know, things like dimers or trimers, so low valence molecules. What that means we can discuss at the end of the talk, but what we decided to do was to say, well, okay, there seems to be this preference for sort of effectively zero effective solvation volume or a positive effective solvation volume. What would, let's say, titration of the effective solvation volume of linkers do for us? And that's the question, how does the effective solvation volume of disordered linkers influence the phase behavior of linear multivalent proteins? Now, you can try to do these calculations analytically, uh, and in fact, um, um, Dan Devery and, and Sam Safran have actually published a recent paper in Soft Matter where they have actually done precisely that. We weren't that clever, so we decided to take a much more brute force computational approach um, and so here, what we're going to do is include in our simulation hundreds to thousands of poly SH3 and poly PRM molecules. These poly PRMs are going to be modeled as polymers with blue beads. Um, the poly SH3s are going to be modeled as polymers with red beads. And what we're going to do is fix the interaction strength between a single SH3 and PRM to be sort of governed by the intrinsic dissociation constant. We'll also require that each SH3 can make an interaction with only one PRM. That's making sure you're respecting the stoichiometry. Uh, and then what we start with is linkers that have zero effective solvation volume, which on a lattice you can actually be extremely slick about and simply model them as just phantom chains that provide distance restraints between the SH3 domains or between the PRMs. I'll show you a movie where we start these molecules off fully dissociated and pretty much within a few Monte Carlo moves, what you start to see are essentially these spherical structures forming. And I should point out that the only information in here is the intrinsic association constant, the valence, which in this case has seven SH3 domains and seven PRMs, and the specification of the property of the linkers as being zero effective solvation volume. I'll play that again. The molecules effectively huddle together and give us what looks like a surface tension minimizing spherical droplet, right? So what we then asked was, let's quantify this percolation idea, which we can quantify in terms of the fraction of molecules that belong to the single largest cluster and we can do concentration titrations in much the same way that the Rosen lab did this. And all data are shown in concentrations of modules. So that way we can compare molecules of different valence to one another. And so along this, along the abscissa, we have the concentration of PRM modules. Along the ordinate, we have concentration of SH3 modules. And what you can see is that above some threshold concentration, pretty much all of the molecules are being collected into a network, okay? So here we ask the question, 
irrespective of whether or not they're in a droplet or they're taking over the entire simulation volume. What we can do is use theory to estimate for this particular system, what is the percolation threshold actually? And it turns out that having 17% of the molecules cross be part of a single largest cluster is sufficient to make a system spanning network. So it doesn't require that all of your molecules go in there. That's actually an important point because it starts to get to the idea that depending on how far one is with respect to the percolation threshold, the connectivity inside of these condensates will be quite different, right? So then we can quantify phase separation by essentially looking at the relative densities of protein modules with respect to the bulk. And what you can see is that at concentrations of PRM and SH3 modules where we have crossed the percolation threshold, we also are making a very dense assembly, right? And I'll put them, uh, and, and so one of the things you can actually do is go back and ask, you know, quantify the organization of these modules with respect to one another using a radial distribution function. A liquid would be a sort of um, highlighted or, or hallmark of a liquid is short range order, long range disorder. And in fact, you see that here, of course, um, what we're doing here is looking at sort of the SH3, SH3 uh, organization that should look just like an ideal gas whereas the SH3 PRM, there is a sort of first coordination shell and eventually you sort of get the long range disorder. Um, and then what we do is we basically look at the comparative analysis here. On the left is how when we change the valence, are we changing the fraction of molecules that are incorporated into the single largest cluster? Let's go along the diagonal. You get back exactly what Mike observed which is that the fraction of molecules that are incorporated into the single largest cluster will be realized at lower concentrations as you increase the valence, okay? So this is purely networking theory. But then we can also track the density transition and you start to see that for these higher valencies, essentially at the juncture when you've crossed the percolation threshold, you've essentially also started to form these dense droplets that are coexisting with dilute bulk phases, unnetworked bulk phases. So we now have this concomitance as postulated of the networking transition and the density transition. The density transition is phase separation. The networking transition is typically known as gelation, but I think in our literature, it gets conflated with the term hardening. So we have taken to referring to it simply as percolation, which refers to forming a system spanning network, which in this case is a droplet spanning network. Now, let's go to the other end. We'll now say that our linkers have a mind of their own. They're not just going to enable the huddling transition of these uh, stickers. They're actually going to exert certain preferences in terms of their solvation properties. Um, and so let's model what happens when we have high effective solvation volumes. And in this case, basically we model each linker site as occupying a lattice site, which means that they have very high positive excluded volume. What, are, what is this going to do? Essentially think about it this way, right? You're going to try to stick your elbows out whilst you're trying to get your the tips of your elbows together and make sticker cross links. So clearly the fact that now your elbows have forearms have girth is going to come in the way. And indeed that's what you find. So essentially these are two simulations of two different systems above the percolation threshold, low ex effective solvation volume, you get spherical droplets coexisting with the dilute phase but with the explicit linkers, essentially what you get is, you know, this ability to form a fully volume spanning network, but they never make droplets, right? So this led us to basically now start to think in terms of what the spacers are doing. They are essentially imparting cooperativity, and this is something we can formally quantify. So it turns out that if you go to the classic theories of Florian Stockmeyer, you can analytically, given the valence and the intrinsic dissociation constant, on a pen and paper, calculate what the percolation threshold will be for whatever system you're interested in. 
1941, right? You have to do the hard work to do the simulation to calculate what the percolation threshold will be in the simulation, where of course, in the simulations, we account for the effects of these spacers. So what we realized is that a simple order parameter that quantifies this ratio as a function of link or length will give us a sense of two things. One is, when is phase separation aiding percolation? And when is percolation happening independent of phase separation? Well, if C star, this ratio is less than one, we are now realizing percolation at concentrations that are quite a bit lower than what Flory and Stockmeyer would have decreed, which means that phase separation is providing this positive cooperativity, right? Um, some people like to refer to this as avidity. To me, that is a, something of an ill-defined term. So we'll refer to this as positive cooperativity, whereby the density transition enables the networking. If C star is just one, then we're in the Flory Stockmeyer limit. But if C star is greater than one, what we're actually getting now is the linkers are coming in the way of you know, the networking transition and certainly obliterating phase separation. So let me orient you. We now basically plot C star against linker length for three separate systems, the 3-3, three, three, the 5-5, five, five, the 7-7 seven, seven system. The 7-7 seven, seven system is basically seven SH3 domains in one polymer, seven PRMs in the other polymer, and we've got hundreds of these. Let's look out in the long linker limit. If my linker is long enough, and by the way, here uh, on the bottom axis, we, we plot linker, number of uh, linker sites in, in terms of number of lattice sites, we've worked out the mapping. And so effectively, when we go out to this, we're talking about linkers that are about 70, 80, 100 residues long. What is really beautiful is that if you go back and look at a lot of these linear multivalent proteins, typically linker lengths are in the sort of you know, 20 to 35 range. Okay? And they have, of course, certain compositional biases. In the long linker limit, of course, what we will get is that C star is one because the linkers really don't play any role here. Essentially, the only thing that matters is there the translational diffusion of the stickers with respect to one another. You get back the Flory Stockmeyer limit. At very short linker lengths, you essentially get the problem that. Um, all of the interactions can be made in small MERS, right? So you can get network arresting dimers and trimers and things of that nature forming. So C star is actually going to be greater than one because you actually don't get a network that can grow. But then there is an optimal linker length for certain, and this is the case when we have the effective solvation volume being zero. I should have made that clear. Um, so when we have effective solvation volumes being zero, there is an optimal linker length where in fact now what you'll get is C star less than one indicative of the fact that you get droplets that are percolated coexisting with the dilute phase that is non-percolated. Conversely, if we go and sort of ask exactly the same question, but now of these explicit linkers that have these very high effective solvation volumes, C star is actually greater than one throughout because what's happening is that this high bulk is basically arresting both phase separation and cranking up the concentration at which the system will sort of cross the percolation threshold. Okay, so now let's go back and think about, you know, is any of this tunable? So we can start to think about the phase diagrams for phase separation and percolation. And the way we'll plot this is we'll fix the valence, we'll fix the stoichiometry, we'll change the concentration of our polymers, that's along the x-axis, and we'll pretend that we can make mutations along the SH3 domains or on the PRMs to titrate the affinity. And the type of phase diagram you expect to see is as follows. For some threshold affinity, you'll start to see phase separation, namely two-phase behavior. And what you'll get is the crossing of the percolation threshold inside of this two-phase regime. But if the interactions are too weak, then you have to cross some very high threshold and then you'll sort of get the classic salt to gel or you know, dilute phase to sort of percolated network transition. So what we'll do is basically titrate these effective solvation volumes of linkers and ask what happens. So here is our two-phase regime for um, effective solvation volumes being zero. 
I'll start to crank up the effective solvation volume. You'll see the two-phase regime narrowing and goes away. I can play this movie backwards. Um, so let's do this again. I'm increasing the effective solvation volume. I'm shrinking or destabilizing the two-phase regime. I need to go to higher affinities in order to realize phase separation. And basically now I obliterate it, right? So you might be thinking, well, you know, where is nature's knob to tune effective solvation volume? Well, post-translational modifications are the most obvious way in which this happens, and we'll talk about this. So it turns out that it's not just multivalence, but it's actually the properties of the disordered linkers that also contribute to the phase behavior of linear multivalent proteins. For linkers, the key parameter is the effective solvation volume, which is encoded by sequence. And fortunately, we are in a place where so much work has come before this type of work in the intrinsically disordered protein literature of mapping sequence to ensemble relationships from the labs of Julie Foreman K, Ben Schuler, Tanya Mittag, Peter Bight, Martin Blackledge, um, and so on, including us, uh, Robert Best, where now you can actually quantify these properties and sort of directly calculate uh, with some hard work the effective solvation volumes from sequence. And the key point is that this convolution of phase separation and percolation is what enables these phase transitions to occur at physiologically relevant concentrations rather than in the you know, sort of millimolar ranges. And this is the point that it can be tuned and that's the point that I'll connect to right away. What I should point out is that um, if you're interested in doing these types of simulations, um, Zhang Mo Che, a former postdoc, and Furkan Dar, a current graduate student, have actually put together an engine. This is actually engineered almost exclusively by Furkan, um, an engine called LASI, um, which basically sort of enables these calculations. It's available free of charge on GitHub. Um, I should point out that this is more of a sort of, you know, if you're a physics nerd and you like to play with things, this would be the perfect tool. There's a complementary tool, which we'll discuss next time, that comes from Alex Holhaus, which is PIMS, which is much more of a plug and play type of engine. Okay, so I will actually sort of jump ahead to the concept of multi-component systems because I wanna keep that in our um, field of view. So if I gave you different numbers of molecules, so we took the PRM SH3 system and we said, well, there were two types. What if I had n different types? The Gibbs phase rule says that I could get n plus one coexisting phases. What does that actually mean? Let's take a simple example. I've got a solvent, two types of polymers. Here is my well-mixed case, which all of biochemistry has tried to fixate on forever, right? I mean, we, want to, we don't want aggregates. We don't want condensates. We don't want phase separation. Now I could get two-phase behavior where now I have, let's say, um, a condensate that forms that's enriched in polymer P2, and then I have a, a, a sort of coexisting phase that's enriched in the solvent and P1. I could have the sort of traditional view that perhaps condensates are just bags, right? That all, both our macromolecules have ended up in a condensate and this is coexisting with a dilute phase. There's the Amy Gladfelter story, which basically is that you can get unmixed condensates that sort of basically coexist with one another because these P1 and P2 really don't like one another, but they don't like the solvent either. They end up in sort of different condensates. But the really more interesting case is this situation where you get this type of wetting behavior where, you know, you get this core shell architecture whereby in the core you have an enrichment of one type of polymer wetted by a shell that is enriched in another type of polymer that coexists with a sort of solvent-rich phase. So what Tyler asked was, let's take this ultra simple system and make certain tweaks to the valence, to the affinity or to the linkers and generate a uh, sort of spatially organized droplet where we'll have, let's say one protein in the core, one protein in the shell uh, let's say, uh, and then we'll have, let's say, you know, a, a protein that exists in sort of both, uh, and then one protein that effectively is straddling uh, things in a certain way, right? So cut a long story short, it turned out that actually the simplest way in which we could make this be realized is simply take half our poly-SH3 molecules 
and have them connected by high excluded volume linkers. When we do that, essentially what you get is a spatial organization where the blue molecules are the ones that have the low excluded volume linkers. The PRMs are all low excluded volume linkers, so they're straddling the core and the shell. And what you get back is a corona or a shell that's made up of these high excluded volume linkers uh, that's basically making up the, the shell. And in fact, the design was achievable quite nicely, where now you get essentially poly SH3 with our Flory random coil or low excluded volume linkers making up the core. So by the time we come out a certain distance from the center, that density has just decayed off to zero. Whereas the molecules connected by the high excluded volume linkers are close to zero density near the core. They make up mostly the shell. And then our poly PRM, which is providing the complementary interactions is effectively straddling both the core and the shell. And in fact, what we then set about doing was titrating. So we said, is it affinity? Is it valence? We did all the titrations, but really <clears throat> the gist of it was that, you know, as you crank down the excluded volume, so as we basically sort of decrease the effective solvation volume on the high excluded volume linkers, we start to lose the spatial organization. But if we crank that up, we get this core shell effect. So what that says is that a simple precept is differential solvation of disordered linkers can actually give you these spatially organized droplets. And in fact, if you think back to some of Mike's recent work in collaboration with the Vail Lab, you see this type of behavior where essentially you have exactly the same polymer, but it's a mixture of molecules where the linkers are, let's say, phosphorylated and the linkers are not phosphorylated. And although they didn't focus on this, what you can bet your cotton socks on is that there is a sort of core shell architecture actually formed. So what I will do is end on a note that you know, we can go well beyond synthetic systems because these concepts transfer over quite beautifully. And in fact, uh, when Tyler was putting this work together, Cliff um, Brangwin visited us and he said, hey guys, let me give you something more concrete and practical to think about rather than your poly sa 3 poly PRM system because we have this observation on the nucleolus, which looks, which of course many of you know, is essentially the nuclear reactor, if you will, of the nucleus in that that's where you actually assemble ribosomal subunits. Um, but what is sort of also well known is that the nucleolus actually has several layers to it and it's best illustrated in this movie where what Marina Ferrick did when she was in Cliff's lab was she took um, the oocytes and she effectively um, inhibited the actin network using latrunculin A. And what you now start to see is this coarsening behavior where all of the nucleoli basically condense into one gigantic nucleolus. But what even more important than that, I call your attention to the staining here, nucleophosmin is in red fibrillarin is in green, and then polar E1, which is the marker for the fibrillar center, is in blue. So you certainly, the DFC, which is the dense fibrillar center, and the fibrillar center, they're sort of intermixed, but you clearly see this core shell architecture, right? Nucleophosmin on the outside, fibrillarin on the inside. And then Marina went on to did some beautiful work um, where she basically reconstituted this behavior with a simple three component system involving ribosomal RNA, nuclear, nucleophosmin, and fibrillar. And that gave us, and Cliff basically said, okay guys, if you think you know this is really a differential solvation and multivalence effect, you ought to be able to recapitulate this using a very simple model. And so that's what Tyler Harmon did, was he basically came up with a very simple architecture for fibrillarin the RGG domain and the methyl transferase domain instantiated in this sort of very high resolution description. Ribosomal RNA basically described as, you know, a poly electrolyte high excluded volume. And the key ingredient here was the oligomerization that Richard Kriwaki has taught us a lot about uh, the, uh, of nucleophosmin, where you have the oligomerization domain, the acidic tracts, and then an RRM. But of course it makes a pentamer so that gives you this pentavalence, right? And so again, we put this on a lattice. There is an interaction model that turns out to be absolutely key. 
And the data that Marina and Cliff had collected turned out to be super important in helping us with this because it turned out that the model required attractive interactions between the RGG domain, um, stronger attraction between the RGG domain and the methyl transferase domain. So this inter RGG domain attraction was actually something of a prediction both from the experiments and the model. Then of course you will have the RGG domain, of course, interacting with the R ribosomal RNA, absent that you wouldn't get the core shell architecture. And really, the only thing that the nucleophosmin was doing was interacting with the uh, RNA through the RRM. Everything else was excluded volume and the multivalence. And what we got back rather trivially, it turns out, was a beautiful sort of spatial organization where you get fibrillarin in the core um, the ribosomal RNA straddling the core and the shell and nucleophosmin basically making the, the shell. That's shown in this very clean movie here where we actually essentially end up with the coarsening behavior that you also see in the, uh, in the oocytes, which was, was quite striking for us and very exciting. Rather simple model, simple physics, differential solvation. So we, are, we haven't given up on the nucleolus because there's so many beautiful questions to ask. Um, I'll simply give you a teaser that Matt King, who's something of a champion biochemist who came to us from Sabina Petri's lab, has actually um, succeeded in sort of reconstituting elements of the dense fibrillar center and the fibrillar center on its own. So now we got to start sort of actually doing all the experiments in, in cohesion with, uh, with Cliff, which is going to be really exciting to ask all kinds of design questions. Um, so before I stop, I'll tell you that as next week, what we'll do is sort of go beyond what we've just talked about, build on these concepts, try to see how well they transfer over to describing the phase transitions of intrinsically disordered proteins. And before I end, let me thank, I think I've sort of thrown shouts out to people as I've gone along, but just a reminder, this is the team as of uh, today. Uh, Tyler, as I pointed out, is the person who did all the work that I described. Uh, next week, I'll tell you a lot about what Jong Mo has done. He's now uh, starting up his independent position in Busan in, in Korea. Alex, um, a former postdoc, is a colleague of mine across the park in the biochemistry department. Uh, the work that I described today, basically intellectually inspired by an very close collaboration with Mike. I should point out that Tyler's designs have actually been tested and uh, stay tuned. It turns out to work out quite beautifully with some added nuances of some interesting salt effects and um, I've been very fortunate to interact with Cliff from sort of the get-go and um, we're, we're starting to sort of reboot our collaboration as we start to think about uh, the nucleolus and uh, I'll take Jill's orders leave this slide up hopefully you got up the no shenanigans and I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks very much. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour, but uh, we, we definitely want to want to take some questions. And we realize that some people may have to jump off, but hopefully many of you can, can hang on. And uh, in the chat, we had a few questions come in that I think have already been answered about how the excluded volume was calculated and how the length of the, uh, the spacers factored in. So I think, I think those have already been addressed. Um, but uh, there were a couple of very interesting questions um, from uh, Pinaki Swain. I apologize if I'm butchering your name, um, but if, if you'd like to um, go ahead and ask some of your questions, I think that would be a good place to start uh, if you're still on. So if Jill, if you can unmute Pinaki. And then we have also a question from Bead that we could cover as well if Pinaki is not available. Hi, this is Pinaki. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to know if uh, uh, homopolymers which do not have this thicker spacer heterogeneity, uh, whether they would only go LLPS in a poor solvent and won't form gelation at all at any concentration? Is that it? That's a very good question. And so, of course, that will depend entirely on what type of homopolymer one has. So one of the things that I think is really valuable to remember is that if you go and dig deep into the sort of homopolymer phase separation literature, um, it's kind of 
taken on this idea that it largely is LLPS, but in fact, if you go back and think about those types of systems, what they will do is actually make a dilute, away from the critical point, a dilute solution that is described primarily as being a gas of globules that will coexist with a dense phase that some polymer physicists will actually refer to as a sediment. And in that dense phase, the molecules will essentially behave like they're in a melt where now, because there isn't a driving force to, for the chains to be compacted on one another, they will essentially um, behave like Gaussian chains. So the radius of gyration will go something like n to the one half, where n is the uh, number of repeating units. So you're absolutely right. Um, this networking ability, um, this type of phase separation and percolation shouldn't be realizable for your garden variety homopolymers. Thank you. And I have another question, like uh, the core cell architecture observed in case of nuclear loss, uh, both the phases have different material properties and- different. Yes, and also, that's exactly right. So it turns out, of course, that, um, and this is something that, you know, is still a bit of a ways to sort of work out, you know, the, the connection between the thermodynamics and the rheology, but you're absolutely right that the core, the fibrillarin core is actually uh, on, so, and, and this is a, an important caveat, when interrogated on exactly the same time scales, the fibrillarin core is classified as a viscoelastic material, whereas the shell has more like a viscous material. But of course, that depends entirely on what time scales you are probing these things at, right? So the underlying moduli both storage and uh, elastic moduli are different for one another. And that to zeroth order you can rationalize as coming about due to two things. One is that the strengths of the interactions are possibly different, but at least in our model, it's entirely due to the sort of wealth of more interactions that you have characterizing the core when compared to the shell. Uh, is there any correlation between the interfacial tension um, Absolutely. So I don't know if you got to see that. I kind of, uh, I was slightly mindful of the, um, um, the time getting away from us, but notice that when we were parameterizing this, um, we use a flory chi parameter to parameterize the strengths of the interaction. But of course, for these types of systems, they are sort of, you know, they effectively mean the same thing as the interfacial tension. And so basically what we're saying um, and, and this, by the way, also was corroborated and actually um, uh, driven by, by Cliff's lab, uh, where they showed that fibrillarin would essentially be effectively more hydrophobic when compared to nucleophosmin, and that you can effectively think about by thinking about the relative surface tensions of, let's say, fibrillarin plus RNA in interface with the solvent versus NPM1 plus RNA interface with the solvent. And what should happen in order for this to work out is gamma 1, 2 should be smaller than gamma 1, 3. But if it is quite a bit larger, then you will just get unmixed condensates, right? So there's the, the inequality has to A, be satisfied, but there are also bounds on the inequality. Okay. So from interfacial tension, can you tell something about whether the phase will be viscous or viscoelasticity or that. Um, as proxies, yes, but there needs to be sort of a much more elaborate because again, the elasticity versus the viscosity, those are really, you know, depends on the time scale over which you, inter, uh, you, you interrogate the material, right? And that becomes, a, so it, it is then directly tied to the time scale for the making and breaking of the crosslinks and the extent of crosslinking. So yes, those are useful proxies, but they are not one-to-one -one corresponders. Thank you, Thanks, Panaki. Thank you. So I, I think uh, we'll go to uh, to Bead. Um, Bead, okay. you had a, an interesting question. Rohit, um, thanks, first of all, for a conversation that were a talk that was accessible to biologists. I appreciate that. Um, so you juxtapose these scenarios where you have percolation directly, which you said is unlikely to occur in biology, and then you have percolation sort of mixed with or as a function of phase separation. Do you think there are going to be exceptions to this? Are there, are there gonna be proteins or systems that, that gel 
at physiological concentrations, and, and I sort of say this as someone who I think might have observed this in a test tube. Yeah. Um, and, and if so, how might that difference manifest itself in a cell, right? Because I don't, I don't envision a, a cell spanning uh, system. Yeah, so, um, well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I'm gonna put that slide up. So the, here are our three scenarios. Yeah. And I should point out that actually, um, so when I selectively chose the one at the top, I, I should have clarified that that was a scenario that for my way of thinking was about condensates. But it also turns out that Simone Alberti has shown, uh, Christine Jacobs Wagner has shown, and there are several other data, um, C. Stecker has shown these examples as well, where you can actually get whole cell gelation, right? So effectively, if you subject yeast to pH shocks, for example, you can just change the material properties of the entire single cell organism. And, and of course, Christine has been studying bacteria. So you see that in bacteria. So the answer is yes, you will end up with a full cell wide percolating network um, I should also point out that Mike has uh, pointed out to me that when they tune the properties of the linkers, or let's say they make, they use mutations on the SH3 domains, or they see this with the sumo sim system as well, where there are mutations that are weakening the affinity. Now, when they go to high enough concentration, they basically get these test tube spanning networks. So, and you can, and that you can read out by a variety of things, the scattering goes through the roof. You don't see any spherical condensates. If you image things, they look like these sort of very irregular spiny structures uh, that have no bearing or no, no similarity to spherical condensates. So the answer is yes, it's really about sort of the collective tuning of valence, linker properties, affinities of the stickers for one another, and are the spacers bringing along any other auxiliary sticky interactions, right? So in, in these minimalist systems, that's what it will take, but in cellular systems, you absolutely can cause a cell to percolate, right? I hope that that's answers great. your question. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah, that, that's great. So I think um, we'll wrap up with uh, one, one last question um, let's see. Uh, let's say Samrat, if you're still on, <clears throat> you had yeah. you you said you had a question. Thank so you. go ahead, please. Thank you. So Rohit, uh, beautiful talk. Uh, so we learned a lot about uh, phase separation. So I had a quick question about uh, the disordered linker which you uh, referred to as contributing to the huddling together to form the system spanning network. So my question is, is this disorder linker is also responsible for the, for the breaking of the interactions. So it is essentially sort of uh, catching up the weak interactions and trying to sort of break it apart uh, on a characteristic time scale. And the next question is how this characteristic time scale of the making and breaking of interaction is coupled with the strength of the interaction that governs the phase transition, especially uh, to get to a critical uh, mesoscale size of that particular uh, droplet. Yeah, those are, those are excellent questions. Um, and so <clears throat> two comments, first is that um, all of my sort of comments about time scales have been super qualitative uh, because this is actually something that we need to start uh, thinking about in greater detail. Um, so the, the second, uh, but that, that's simply a rider. Now going directly to your point, um, you can absolutely see that the excluded volume or the effective solvation volume of the linker will definitely contribute to the time scales over which these cross links are made and broken, right? Because you can start to, and, and because effectively the barrier to dissociation will be governed by how easily they're pulled apart versus how uh, cohesively they stick to one another. So if the stickers, or sorry, the spacers bring to the table some isotropic attractions, for example, 
those will start to give us sort of more long-lived crosslinks. If our, so um, conversely, if the spacers start to provide sort of an excluded volume, that will be the way in which you will start to sort of more readily dissociate the, um, the um, sticker sticker crosslinks. And so you're, it is absolutely the case that the spacer excluded volumes will indeed contribute. And so just to sort of put this into perspective, if you go back and look at the way we calculate the excluded volume, um, you will see that the interspacer interaction strength is actually sort of baked into that, right? I mean, that's what the, right. uh, the W of R is, that potential of mean force. And so one of the things we can start to do is to go back and effectively do things like bond lifetimes uh, or intersticker crosslink lifetimes as a function of the either the strength of these spacer spacer interactions or in a much more sort of uh, linker wide readout as a function of the effective solvation volume. And I think what you will start to see are two things. One is that if the linkers are all the same, then you will get a certain sort of characteristic time scale. But what is beautiful is that the linkers have a lot of heterogeneity. So it's never the case that in biology, uh, the linkers are exactly the same between any pair of sure. domains. They're always quite different. And I think that actually leads to this encoding of a hierarchy of time scales as well. That's great. Well, this has been wonderful. Um, we're already about 15 minutes over, so I think this is probably a good stopping sp spot. I'm sure um, uh, to all the other uh, participants, if you have additional questions, just get in touch with Rohit. Um, he's he's never he's never uh, unwilling to share his knowledge as he has just done for us today. He's uh, wonderful in that way. Um, so uh, Rohit, thank you very much. And uh, Jill and Rebecca, thanks for organizing this and to all the participants. It's great to see you and hopefully we'll see all of you and lots more of your friends next Wednesday. Same time, same channel. So great. thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jill. And thank you all for showing up. Yeah. Great lecture. Thank you, Rohit. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.